Good evening, everyone. I'm going to always like to honor people who show up on time, so I think we'll get started. Uh, and I don't, I don't know, we won't try and get you out of here on time. We will get you out of here on time because our colleague has to actually speak to a class right after this. There's no rest at all this week. Thanks for coming out. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. On behalf of my colleagues, Rob Lang and Caitlin Saladino, thanks again for coming out. Uh, and thanks to our Greenspun College colleagues who are recording the event for us. For you note takers in the audience, we already have Jeff's PowerPoint up on our website, so if you miss a data point or a, a trend, you'll have a resource to check on that. And we'll have this lecture, up, uh, the video up on our website next week. Uh, so let your friends know. We're excited to have Jeff Gutman back out with us. Jeff is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings, and he came to Brookings after a long and distinguished <coughs> career at the World Bank. So he's going to have a, a global perspective on a very important topic to us tonight as we talk about urban transport, congestion, and access. So Jeff, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out. Um, I must say, last time I was here, two years ago, the topic was public procurement and corruption. We didn't have as big a crowd. <laughs> so I guess urban congestion and access is a little more tangible. Um, but in any case, uh, I'm calling this is the urban, current urban transport model broken. Not sure that's the right title, but at the end, we'll, we'll probably ask me, so is it broken? I'm not sure I have the answer. So let me. Uh, explain a few things, and then talk about my own background and the research, because this is part of a research project that we were just in the beginning of at Brookings Institution. Uh, first, I think we're all aware that there is increasing worldwide attention to the issues of urbanization and the issues of infrastructure. Uh, number one on urbanization or and on infrastructure, we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that have been acclaimed by all the world. Uh, which actually puts a very big emphasis on urbanization, very different than the Millennium Development Goals that we had up until now. Uh, similarly, there's a, a great focus on the access to infrastructure and infra access for all for infrastructure. And so the challenge is now, and then after that, we have the Quito meeting and Habitat happens every 20 years, set forth the agenda on urban. Habitat used to be more focused on developing country types of issues. This one was focused on urbanization and the challenges worldwide. So the now, what we are now focusing on, especially with the Sustainable Development Goals, is trying to find what are we trying to maximize? What are the indicators? What do we look at after so many years when this plan is over that we can say we've actually achieved it? And what I'm going to say in urban transport, we actually have a major challenge. We have a lot of confusion and this is a key point to bring up the topic in terms of issues, but also in terms of definition. For myself, as you heard, my background is at the World Bank. I'm more of an operator on the ground. I've worked in Latin America and Africa and East Asia, uh, less so in the United States for the last there until coming to Brookings. So I must say, what I, although I'll talk about the US, and I have a lot of data in the US because the US has more data than most other places, uh, frankly, a lot of my work, and I'll weave it into here, is about other countries and what's happening in some other countries. But it's all very relevant. It's just changing context, changing scale, little change in emphasis, excuse me. Um, so just keep that in mind. And in terms of rules of the game, what I suggest, because I'm covering a lot of material, some of it more uh, detailed, and I'll try to keep it as, as broad as, as we can, that's relevant. Uh, but if you have questions, I think just raise your hand and interrupt me. Or you think, this is ridiculous. Don't, why are you saying that? Please feel free to raise your hand, throw fruit, anything. Uh, but I think the best way is not to wait till the end, but to actually ask the question when it's clear in your mind. And I'll see if we're on the right track. I hope that's OK for the rules of the game. Now let's see if I can do this right. No, I went the wrong way. OK. Um, so what are the key points I hope you get out of this lecture? Uh, the first is that social equity is missing from the sustainable urban transport dialogue. Let me explain what I'm thinking there. Basically, we talk about sustainability, urban sustainability, and urban transport sustainability. 
And we usually miss the point that there are two elements to sustainable development. One is environmental, that gets a lot of attention, but the other is social, inclusiveness, equity. And that usually gets put aside to a secondary role and usually not considered when a lot of people are talking about sustainability. But when I talk about sustainability, I talk about it in the broad role. And here I want to emphasize the focus on social equity and inclusiveness. And whether the dialogue and the methods and the, the way we measure infrastructure, transport infrastructure and urban development, whether that is actually truly inclusive or whether it goes contrary to actually an inclusive development, sustainable development. Um, the second is the lack of a common definition or measure of urban access across disciplines. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that in the beginning as to what do we mean by urban access. It's really a critical issue because if we don't have a common narrative and a common understanding of what it is we're trying to work on or work towards, then we're really not going to be able, it's, it's like a Tower of Babel. And actually now we do have a Tower of Babel when it comes to what do we mean by urban transport access. And finally, that addressing urban access faces serious practical challenges in implementation. I think we find this everywhere. We are looking at new approaches on planning, transport planning, land use planning, fiscal and financial instruments, and also governance. And what we want to do is put a lens of accessibility. What would it look like? What would these initiatives be, positive or negative, if you put on the, uh, the lens of accessibility? Now there's already a lot of theory out there. It actually goes, a lot of this goes back to the 1950s. The problem is we haven't moved from theory into practice and we've taken other routes to be able to judge what's good in urban transport and what's not. And there are a lot of practical issues in terms of moving that and that's really what we're trying to get towards. In the Brookings analysis and working on this urban accessibility issue, we're in the first stage. We're kind of looking at the state of the art. What do we know? What do we know we don't know, and what don't we know we don't know, basically. Um, and so we've spent the last year, and a lot of this comes out of the work and other studies that have been done prior. We want to move from this stage to more to the practice. How do we engage across the major disciplines, like transport, like urban planning, like fiscal and financial affairs? How do we bring them together to be able to actually operate uh, and to promote accessibility and to look at the practical side? And what are the gaps? in terms of our knowledge, in terms of primary data. And that's where we're going to go next. So if you're thinking, I'm going to give you an answer at the end of this, uh, and some have called this a very dark presentation. It's dark because we still don't have the answers and we're getting to it. But don't take it too, too hard. So first is defining urban transport access. What do we mean by access for all? If we talk about electricity, if we talk about water, if we talk about telecommunications, we actually, all of us probably in this room, could come up with an indicator that's quite rightly apropos for measuring whether or not we have access to each of these pieces of infrastructure. We usually say what percentage of the households have access to electricity, have access to water, have access to telecommunications. Pretty straightforward. But now if I ask you, what is the measure of urban transport? What is access for urban transport? What was the indicator? What would be the indicator that you would use? And there it would be actually much more difficult. Uh, we actually went and had three think pieces. Actually, the, if you go to the website Moving to Access on the Brookings website, all the papers, blogs, they're all actually starting to be posted there. So you can actually see a lot. Some of the initial papers came out in January. Um, so we had three papers, one done by an urban transport person uh, another one done by an urban land person, and another one done by a fiscal economist, fiscal and financial economist. To talk about, there were think pieces, and they're on the web, to say, okay, how do they perceive the issue of urban access? And there was a lot of, and what are the constraints to be able to promote urban access and urban transport access? And they all seem to point to the transport sector. They said the transport sector is the problem, because the transport sector doesn't know what it wants to measure. The transport sector is confused. And so we had another study that was done, and that isn't published yet. It was a review of 32 master plans, transport master plans, land use master plans around the world in higher income countries, mainly OECD countries. And of those 32, only, they all talked about access, but only seven of them had real indicators. 
there is a total confusion as to what do we mean by access. And that's a real challenge if you're going to go forward, if you're going to measure something under the Sustainable Development Goals and have a bumper sticker, you know, what is it going to be for urban transport? Yet each of us here is pretty much an expert. We know how we interact with urban transport. I must say, I'm not an expert on Las Vegas, and I should give you a cautionary note. The more I hear about Las Vegas, the more I find it unique in many ways. In, and so uh, you may find some things that are relevant, and you might say, well, I don't see that. But I'll leave that for you to decide. So with the confusion in the sector, it comes down that there are three basic definitions of access the, uh, by the transport sector professionals. And I'll give you those three and see what you think in terms of what they measure. The first is probably the most used. It's the quality of mobility. A lot of times we talk about mobility for all. A lot of times we talk about access for all. Mobility is the ability to move. Access is the ability to get somewhere. So it has more of the destination in it. But we tend to use a very engineering-oriented definition in which mobility is the flow of vehicles. And when we want to optimize it, we talk about reducing congestion. We talk about increasing speeds. And this is the measure that's typically used in economic analysis. It's probably the most popular when it comes to urban transport and the most used. But it doesn't tell you a lot, and land use is usually a given in this, but it doesn't tell you a lot beyond the existing demand on the road. It doesn't tell you about the origin and destination. And if you wanted to figure out who doesn't have access to getting to a destination, access to transport, it wouldn't tell you much at all. You're just taking care of the flow. But that is particularly, it's not wrong. It's just not the whole enchilada. It just doesn't tell you everything. But that is what we mostly use today. Let me take the second one. Second one sounds a little bit like the electricity one. It reflects the physical accessibility of the transport network. The distance from a household to a road or the distance from a household to a train station or a bus station. This is access to the transport system. We use it a lot in rural roads. We say, especially in developing countries, you should be within three kilometers of a all-weather road. And that probably works. If you want to say that, for an urban resident, it's really meaningless. The roads are pretty ubiquitous. If I say you're within so many minutes of a road, it doesn't really tell you much. Everybody is within a certain distance of a road. Also, uh, the public transit people actually have promoted the use of transit stations. That's actually very interesting. And you go to ITDP, the International Transport Group, they will tell they're starting to measure how many people are within so many minutes of a train station or a bus station. They have access to public transport. That sounds OK. But what if the public transport doesn't go where you want to go? And we have a lot of that happening. So it doesn't tell you access in that term. These are not wrong. They're actually useful. But they're only useful in very limited ways. And they don't get to the basic issue of do we have equitable access? If you're in a neighborhood, a low-income neighborhood, do you have access to where you want to go or where you need to go. Which brings me to the broad definition, the one I like to use and the one that I, I will be using for this, this lecture, is access to opportunities. Basically, it's the ultimate objective of the transport system. How does it connect you and each of the households in your community to jobs, social services, clinics, commerce? And how do you measure that? You can measure that by how many jobs are within a ra given radius of your community or your neighborhood. And then mobility, and that is measured usually, and I'll come to that, by the distance and the time it takes to get there, and with the nearer the distance weighted heavier than the farther. I can explain that in more detail. That may be a little bit confusing. What it does, though, it's not only about mobility. This definition has two levers that you can pull to actually improve accessibility. You can improve it by improving the flow of vehicles. That actually works. By improving mobility for a neighborhood, you can expand the number of jobs they're accessible to, the clinics, the hospitals, the schools. That works. But you also have another alternative. Without changing mobility, you can change land use. You can take a clinic, you can have a neighborhood 
and say the neighborhood does not have a clinic within a reasonable distance. Well, you can improve the transport to one that's farther out, or you can move the clinic closer in, or the jobs closer, or the housing closer. You can do very many things with land use, but we usually miss that. So in this definition, you're trying to bring together the land use together with the transport to be able to talk about access to opportunities. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, that sounds perhaps very simple, but measuring that, getting to the bottom of it, even fitting it on a bumper sticker, doesn't really work. And that's the challenge. Whoops. So how do we measure? Actually, it was a comment made by the CEO of Massachusetts DOT, Stephanie Pollack. She said, it's a problem in the transport sector. We don't have the words yet to describe and gain the constituency to be able to promote equitable transport across the United States and I would say across the world. Whoops. Now this is the problem in the transport sector. When we talk about measuring, we, we come with isochrones, gravity models, and whatever else. It's very good for those that are technically observant of the transport sector, but it, again, it's not great on bumper stickers. And if you ask a policymaker, you won't be able to do anything. But this is basically one of the measures. But let me give you something more specific. Now here is um, the measure of accessibility in terms I'm talking about that actually is done by David Levinson out of the University of Minnesota, one of the gurus of this measuring of accessibility. And actually RTC here in Las Vegas actually contributes to it. And you'll see it's measuring, uh, let's see if I can do it. Las Vegas is here. It was 22nd in 2010 amongst uh, 50 of the 49 of the 50 top metropolitan areas. And it moved, whoops. I'm challenged. <laughs> Scott? it? Ah, there it is. Las Vegas is there, 18. Now what is this measuring? This is measuring taking census blocks and measuring how many jobs are within 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes of that block, of the people in that block. It's focused on jobs. You can do the same with services, with clinics, with commerce, but it measures that and it weights those employments so that the farther away it is, the lower the weight. The closer it is, the higher the weight. Then it's put together and it comes out with an indicator and putting the blocks together, you have city accessibility. Now this, I should warn you, is done by mode. So this is for automobiles. In Las Vegas does pretty well on automobiles. If I showed you the one for transit, it doesn't do as well. Obviously it's more of an auto-oriented city. Um, but the measure is happening. And so it's being done. It's also being done elsewhere. I just found last week uh, my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, Gilles Durantan, just did an accessibility measurement for 152 cities in India. We're doing it in Kigali. What is different is suddenly we're able to get data in a way that we never could before. With Google Maps, with open data sources, we're able to get information down to the census block and be able to measure the employment as well as the population and get the distances of the transit network and transport network and weight it. And actually, we'll see more of the application of this. So we actually have an ability to have a lens. We also have the ability to do it at the block level. So I can tell you whether this block has access to jobs versus one on the other side of town. And that's really where you can get into equity. You can take a neighborhood that's low income and say, what's their accessibility? And you can take another neighborhood and say, what's their accessibility? Then you get to the real issue of who wins and who loses in terms of transport and land use in the urban context. I hope I, I'm, well, everybody seems awake, so that's really good. If there are questions, you know, raise your hand, because I'm going to go into, yeah. You'll forgive me. Sure. Can you repeat your, how you're measuring accessibility, you're, you're saying jobs. Are you measuring the distance? The distance, but the distance is affected by, uh, by congestion. So it's time and distance, and you could also throw in, it would be a generalized travel cost model. You could put in uh, uh, affordability as well. You could put in cost. Usually it's done with time and distance. So you get a virtual distance 
that's the 10 minutes, but it's 10 minutes including congestion. It can be done at different times of day. It's very complex. It's very tough to do, but it does tell you pretty much what happens. I'll show you a little more in application when we do an al in terms of analysis. So this is where I think a lot of the future is going, where a lot of people are looking, particularly if you're looking at equity. But the problem we have is when you look at, now that you know how to measure accessibility, what happens today when we do our typical analyses of investments in transport, in urban transport? And what happens with cost-benefit analysis? This is the typical analysis It's used in the World Bank. It's used everywhere. It's historical. It's cost-benefit analysis, travel time and vehicle operating costs. And uh, let me, you've seen, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but this is the general composition of a cost-benefit analysis for transport investment. Um, banks use it, most general countries use it. You have vehicle operating cost savings by putting your vehicle in different situations, whether it be the surface of the road or the speed, you can actually analyze the vehicle cost operating. It's very good for interurban roads, not so good on urban. Travel time savings, how much time is saved? That's really the critical issue because that's the biggest benefit that you get in urban transport investments. You get a travel time saving and the biggest cause of concern depending how you do it. Safety improvements, there are measures for doing safety improvements. Live saves to health uh, through better safety precautions. Uh, polluting emissions, now you can do things with costing carbon footprint and things like that. But basically, in urban transport, it's travel time savings. The costs are the initial investment costs, plus the operating maintenance costs over the time period of the project and then you have a discount factor, and depending on what kind of discount factor you use, will tell you how far the benefits will go uh, in terms of building up your economic rate of return. But the real issue is travel time savings. Because travel time savings, how do you calculate them? You basically try to break down the purpose of the trip. It could be for work, commuting to work. Let's separate commuting to work versus a work trip, like a trucker or a bus driver. We're a bus or, bus or truck driver, that's pretty easy. You have their wages. If they save an hour, they save some productivity. What do you do for the commuter? Then we're using about the same. We think that if you're commuting to work and we can improve that efficiency, it'll go back into productivity. So rather than trying to get the, the increase in produ production of an urban area, we actually use travel time savings. The problem is we're using a value, a value that differentiates between those with higher incomes and those with lower incomes. And in historical terms, that's been a problem, obviously. Uh, we've had various ways of trying to get around that, try to neutralize it, but that is historically a problem and why a lot of people are attacking, and they've been attacking for the last 10 years, the use of cost-benefit analysis such as this for economic analysis and actually cause changes in how different countries are now looking at how they're going to evaluate investments. But there, and the third area is what you do if you're going to the store, School, leisure, that's usually a very much smaller value. It's trying to measure on, on what is the utility to you of that trip. I'm simplifying, but it, it basically tells you what it is. So people have turned to multi-criteria analysis, or MCA. This is especially true in Britain, some parts of Europe. Uh, what you do there is say, look, the cost-benefit analysis, I mean, a lot of rules, a lot of theory. So instead of using that black box that no one understands, I'm going to use criteria. And I'm going to say, this is what I want to achieve. It could be time savings. It could be accessibility as we're measuring, increasing the number of jobs within a certain radius. It could be social. It could be safety. And you put them all and you rate them and you figure out with the community, you can actually do it that way and have a rating and have a weighting and put together a priority versus a selection of alternatives. It's a way of engaging the community in something that's much more straightforward than it is um, than using cost-benefit analysis. The problem is it's very subjective. It really doesn't tell you. I mean, it's the, the problem I have with those that have attacked the cost-benefit analysis, and I'm not a big lover of cost-benefit now, but I've better exported it for years at the World Bank. Um, the problem is it's it's it just doesn't give you that issue of accessibility. But the multi-criteria analysis, though it's good politically, 
It may double count benefits. It may, it may have all kinds of distortions. And so we're trying to find new ways to not necessarily replace cost-benefit analysis. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to complement it, to give you that information that you need on accessibility. So let me give you uh, an example out of Lima. They were building a metro line two, and they wanted to connect two very poor areas at the periphery of the city with the highest density of jobs. And so they wanted to make sure this metro did it. So they measured the accessibility of the pro proposed alignment of what they did in the excess in terms of time and did the measures as you have on accessibility, but from those communities as to how you would improve it. And what it showed was a 25% increase in the number of jobs that would be accessible within those limitations of how much is the maximum time you're giving them to go to a job. Like they don't want to travel more than an hour or more than 30 minutes, depending on what you put as your benchmark. And this one, in this case, was increasing it by 25%. Thus, people in a lower income community suddenly had access to larger group of employment. You could have done it for social services. You could have done it for schools, clinics. Uh, but in this case, this is what they, what they did by gaining a 34% gain in travel time. So this was an accessibility measure. Now, the problem you have is, are those jobs relevant? You know, if they're all high-skilled jobs and whatever, you know, do these people get the, and do these people get those jobs in the end? And actually, there are studies in the United States that actually break down by SIC code, by industrial code, uh, different types of jobs, especially in the United States. I don't get this overseas, and I'll explain why. And by doing that, they then assign for low-income area jobs that industry that might be able to offer those kinds of jobs for that kind of community, and, and then do their calculation. They just did this in a case in uh, Chicago, and they found it actually works very well. Uh, so you, you can do this analysis. I've looked at another one, Bogota. I don't know how many people are knowledgeable about accessibility in Bogota. Bogota is well known for its transport innovation. It put the, one of the major innovations in bus rapid transit back uh, 10, 15 years ago, actually funding by the World Bank. This bus rapid transit re actually revolutionized the whole urban transport system within the downtown by replacing the chaotic buses and busitos and piratas that were actually going from place to place. It was a mess. And with really good leadership from a series of mayors, they were able to get this system in place. Uh, and it still runs today, although today it's actually probably at uh, a point where it has to be replaced by something of higher density because they just have too many people. But the problem they found when they did an analysis of accessibility of low-income population is it didn't benefit them. And they were really upset because these people are located at the periphery. Most of low income, especially in develop, developing countries, but we're seeing it here in developed countries, are at the periphery. They're the hardest to get in terms of accessibility. So they looked at what was the problem. And what they found was that they had not, when, when they just took a straightforward accessibility it looked like, in terms of time, they actually would have access to jobs by taking informal transport that they use and connecting it to the system. What they hadn't banked on was the issue of affordability and pricing. And because these people were so far out, they were having to pay extra money to the, the bucero, the busitos, they had to pay it for the transfer, and then they had to pay it to the bus rapid transit. And what they found is by applying the price and by applying an affordability measure, they had cut accessibility potential by 54%. In other words, it was ridiculous. And what they didn't realize is that there was a whole pricing negotiation going on informally outside of the system that actually made it much cheaper for them to take the informal transport directly into town. So what they did was change their fare policy. By doing that, they actually enhanced the ability of low-income populations in those areas to get downtown and increased, truly increased accessibility. They're still measuring it. I mean, it, but it shows how you can use policies rather than investments to actually increase. This is just the, um, I'm not going to go into this because it'll be too much time. But I've been talking so much about transport. And I haven't talked about land use. And land use is always critical to the transport system as 
is the dynamics are always shifting between transport and land use. And it's hard to project, it's hard to tell. And so we come to the question of, well, what do we do about land use? Because that's going to determine whether I can provide accessibility, as we've seen with people in the periphery. This comes from a fellow at NYU, Shlomo Angel, who's been mapping the changes in urban density and urban space over a period of over a century. Uh, no, he hasn't been doing it for over a century, but he's measuring it over time, over a century time. I think I got it. Shlomo wouldn't really accept <coughs> Sali, as he's better known as. Uh, so he said his world pop, and this is what he sees. He sees a continuous de-densification. You know, we keep talking about densify, densify, but he says no matter, it's like a Sisyphusian effort. He said what we see is he believes world population will double in 43 years and urban land cover will double in 19 years. In other words, we're going the other way. And developing countries' urban population will double from 2000 to 2030, while the built-up area will triple. This is really disastrous. This is really tough stuff. I must say, when I talk about developing countries, we're dealing with a whole other set of issues. When you try to do accessibility measures, though they did it in Bogota and they did it in Lima, I think there's some problems. Because what you have that's different from developed countries, you have uh, a high rate of informality. You have a lot of people living in the informal economy. The jobs are not registered. You don't know what the employment is. They're living on informal land with informal titles, informal housing, and they're using informal transport. <coughs> but worse yet, they're urbanizing at a faster rate than we ever urbanized with a lower income and with weaker institutions. So actually, I come at this on my urban international development perspective in terms of wanting to, I see that as the biggest issue to blow up. We're all worried about inequality. I mean, I should have said this at the very beginning. We have increasing inequality in the United States. We have increasing inequality here. Uh, and we have definite inequality in developing countries. If we don't do something to deal with the equity of access, it's one key element in trying to avoid a disaster. And this just shows the global sample that he had from 1990 to 2000. And what you see is you have the land-rich countries, which is the US, Australia, Canada. We have a lot of land. You can see the densities are already pretty low, but they haven't gone up. We haven't densified. Uh, but that's got to realize it's 2000. A lot of people say things are changing. There's a lot of changes going on in their urban densification. Not sure. Europe and Japan, they're constrained by land. And so they're about twice the density, but still de-densifying as well. Twice the density of the US. And then you have the developing countries, the middle income and the lower income. And their densities are twice as high as Europe and Japan, and four times as high as here. Let me give an example. Dhaka, Bangladesh, 555 persons per hectare. Hong Kong, these are case, the worst case examples. And Tacoma, Washington, at 15.7 persons per hectare. I mean, there's quite a spread. Context is everything. So everything I say here has to be taken in different contexts. I mean, adapting these measures is really important. This is how things are developed, just a sexy slide to take your mind off wordy slides. This is Dubai from 1984 to 2016. This is Thailand, Bangkok. So what you see is incredible. I mean, with these maps, it's really wonderful. And it's so obvious. I mean, it's, we know it's happening. Now, what do we talk about in metropolitan America? I have some US statistics because Brookings has done a lot of research over the years. Um, and possibly has presented it here at other times. What we're finding is between 2000 and 2012, the number of jobs within typical commute distance for residents in a major metro area in the United States fell by 7%. As employment suburbanized, and that's where they're finding more and more jobs are going outside, the number of jobs near both typical city and suburban residents fell. And as poor minority residents shifted toward the suburbs in the 2000s, their proximity to jobs fell more than for non-poor and white residents. And residents of high poverty and majority minority neighborhoods experienced particularly pronounced declines in job proximity. It's Elizabeth Nebo from the Metro Group. So we're experiencing this spatial inequity problem. And that's a problem of 
when you look at accessibility, you need to bring, be able to look at the different neighborhoods to be able to address that. And this is just a, a calculation, but it shows how the poor are being affected more in the number of jobs near a typical large metro resident. So this takes the accessibility and sees that it actually is declining, but particularly for low income. Even if you take what happened during 2008 depression, still it's the, non, it's the poor that are actually more affected by economy and by land use. Getting depressed yet? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other side of it, a very interesting statistic that was found by my colleague Adi Tomer and Joe Kane, is that cars are still important even to households that don't have cars. This is from the 2013 census, showed that about 4.5% of workers don't have a car. Yet zero vehicle workers still drive. Over 20% of them drive alone to work, meaning they find a car to beg, borrow, or whatever. Um, another 12% commute in a carpool. And both rates jumped dramatically in 2013, defying national trends toward less driving. And so how is transport access going to really respond to that? Now you understand why it looks like a dark picture. Let me give another, and actually another statistic here is that most of these households live near transit, but the transit doesn't go to where they want to go in terms of where their employment is. Yes? Sir, with, 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 with the World Bank uh, uh, in your perspective, if somebody was to come to you and say, hey, uh, a city would like to go ahead and do an infrastructure, let's say Las Vegas, in, in, in the uh, public transport um, uh, area, to, to re really revolutionize the Las Vegas as far as public transportation is concerned. With, with, with the cars being king is what you're saying there. Would, would, would World Bank back, uh, back that up? I think it depends on the situation. If that's the most appropriate uh, source, if people are in, in the way they're structured. I mean, for example, let's take Atlanta. Atlanta is a very diffuse city, not a, not a hub. If you tried to take the standard of operation, the standard level of service of a Barcelona, which is a city about the same size, which has, I think, 160, don't quote me, 163 kilometers, and everybody is within 12 minutes. If you tried to do the same in Atlanta, you'd need thousands of kilometers. I mean, that doesn't necessarily make sense. I think you have to find some way to, um, some way to take care of the car. I think I'll come back to this at the end, uh, but I think there are other ways to do it. I mean, we've learned that there are a lot of other types of transport. There is an issue which I'm not tackling today is the future, is the shared economy, the Uber types, which actually is gaining ground in developing countries, in low-income areas. I mean, they always had the version of it with informal transit. Now they have it more formalized and computerized. But there's also automated driving, automated cars, which we don't actually, that's the class that's after this thing. Law class wanted to figure that out. We are, my feeling is we're still in the dark as to what the implications are. But obviously things are moving fast. But let me give you another statistic out of Atlanta. Atlanta increased between 1990 and 1999, 700,000 people in population, of which 88% lived or moved to areas that are not within servicing of a metro or a bus. And they increased 400,000 jobs in that period of which 77% are outside of access to a bus or transit. We see the same in other countries. We see it in Buenos Aires. People are going where land is. And it's, it's a question mark. It's something that, that I haven't been able to put my, my hands around. So the issue is we have to be very realistic about what we can do. What Ancha says, we can do so much about densification, but we are fighting a battle. And he would say, we need to prepare for the sustainable growth and expansion of cities in rapidly urbanizing countries rather than seek to constrict and contain them. I would say the model of, of Portland and the model of London with the Greenway, um, he probably would say uh, over time doesn't work. But there are regulatory issues like Washington having only 12 stories 
uh, maximum in the downtown. There are regulations that you should probably rethink if you want a denser city and would change how things are done. But the question I have, this is a real issue that, that I'm trying to tackle, what's the time? Good, I'm on time. Um, is whether we're chasing our tail and the issue of gentrification. This is a hot topic, hot button topic. Um, the word gentrification has a lot of connotations to it, but it's actually misunderstood and there's not a lot of data about it. But anecdotally, we all seem to feel it and worry about it, and we should. But the question is, if we build transit to low-income neighborhoods and we improve those low-income neighborhoods, and that just forces the land values up and then pushes low-income people out, are we better off, worse off, if, or we've just missed the boat? This is a major question. I don't have an answer on it, but let me first, let, what is gentrification? Gentrification is a pattern of neighborhood change in which a previously low-income neighborhood experiences reinvestment and revitalization accompanied by increasing home values and or rents. But to understand whether it's negative or positive really requires detailed analysis. Uh, Professor Vigdor, I think he's at Carnegie now, he wrote a very good paper actually published by Brookings in 2002 that took issue as to you got to go through a lot to understand whether it's negative, whether gentrification is bad or good. You have the people who own houses in the neighborhood, they actually get the value, they capture the value. They can sell, they can cash in, or they can stay and possibly have a higher quality of life at a higher price, or they might have access to more jobs. The people that move out is what you worry about if they're forced out, let's say the renters. The renters are what we worry about most because they're the most volatile and because their prices can change overnight depending on the regulations of the city. Go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, what, I don't know, I keep, I keep coming back to this, but I guess I'm old enough to think about it, but like what is the pr purpose of the urban center? I mean, 150 years ago when we were moving from farms to cities, it was manufacturing hubs, right? So what, what is the question? I mean, if your economy isn't manufacturing, then what drives the urbanization versus a manufacturing hub? Well, I mean, you still have agglomerative economies that are not necessarily manufacturing. It could be in finance, it could be universities, it could be uh, all kinds of professions that gain from agglomeration economies of urban centers or urban location, dense location. And it works, and also for the, the actually even in the manufacturing sector, to be near other, you want to be in, a, in an area where number one, you can get the labor, number two, you can get to, this, to your, your goods out and your inputs in. There's a lot of work on the agglomeration economies, but you have a lot of different development. And CBD is, we're not as centralized as we used to be in the United States. Actually, Las Vegas has more centrality of jobs, a percentage of jobs in a central location than most other cities in the US. I think I saw that statistic, but I, I can't figure out where. I know I looked at a lot of things preparing for this. Um, but it's really, you gotta go through this to figure out whether it's negative or positive. And when they did a lot of analysis on this in, back in early 2000, they said, it's just not clear. There are certain places in New York and other cities where gentrification is coming, but it's not as broad-based, but it is serious. I think we would think about that differently today, and possibly because of this, whether the forces underlying gentrification can be attributed to changes in preference of wealthy households. And basically, when you look, I'm from DC. Uh, DC is gentrifying at a rapid rate. Areas of the District of Columbia, Washington, DC, have changed overnight, where you wouldn't walk in those areas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it then became kind of a classy area where if you were over 35, you fell out of place. Now it's gone to even higher income and the, the, the fast uh, baby boomers moving into the city and moving the people out to Prince George's County into the outlying areas. It's really, you know, we all love it. And for finance and fiscal affairs, we say, ah, we raise the taxes, we can take the income, we can finance the infrastructure. But what happened to the people who are moved out? So we have a study and she looked, and this is by Stephanie Pollack, the head of Massachusetts DOT, but she uh, before that was at the Dukakis Center in Northeastern University. And she took a study, I think it's of 12 metro areas, and tried to find out, and there's not much data on this, tried to find out if you build or extend a metro system, what is the impact? And she took 12 different areas, metro areas, 
and she looked at that actually had added capacity or extended their lines between 1990 and 2000. They had to have done it before 1997 to allow a lag time for the whatever is going to happen to take place because it, it's a lag time that these things happen. And then she started measuring what, what were the changes between the census of 1990 and 2000. And so what you have in the red are the areas that receive the transit improvements, and what you have in the tan or gray, I don't think I'm colorblind, is the greater change in the metropolitan area which, where it's situated. And so what they found in the neighborhood, this is for median household income. Median household income went up 62%. This is, yeah, where the transit was improved, and 38% in the rest, so obviously much more in the transit area. Housing units, the difference was very small. That's a real problem, that's why the prices are going up so fast, because we can't get the housing supply in there. And so basically, that was kind of a wash. Median household income, white population growth, very clear the whites were moving into the, to an area. But this is, this is the kicker. Rents went up 74% in the gentrified area, as opposed to 26% in the greater change of MSA. That is the group. That's the group that most volatile. What we don't know is where they, we don't have measures, empirical measures, of where they actually went. Maybe they're better off. Maybe they're closer to their jobs. Doubtful. But there isn't a lot written on it. And so it's not gentrification per se, but it's displacement because of gentrification of people who wouldn't have left otherwise. And this is just in migration. 71% of the people in the transit area hadn't lived there five years before. Now, how much is natural migration or not? You have the comparison to the rest of the MSA, which is 29%. So these are pretty important characteristics, and they suggest we can't just look at transport. We have to look at land use. Now, Stephanie Pollack put up, well, maybe we should just make transport investment and accept loss of neighborhood diversity as collateral damage or avoid expansion at all. Obviously, it's, she doesn't mean that, but it is kind of what you take. Can, can we, are we chasing our tails? And I think that's something we're thinking about. There's a lot of issues going on now to mitigate the impact of gentrification, whether it be through low-income housing, reserved housing. But the question is, does it work? Does it work at scale? Does it actually deal with the problems? Is it possible? Other cities, I was reading today about Baltimore and Dallas, who are actually taking a broader approach. Actually, they have an accessibility office that is looking more holistically. I hate to use the term holistically. Um, let me erase that. Um, they're looking more broadly at, uh, at how you can deal with putting jobs, services, commerce, as well as housing. But if you just put housing, it's just not going to work. This is just her her way of trying to develop the unintended consequences of neighborhoods. So where do we go going forward? Now that I got you all depressed that things are going down the tubes. I, I think we're seeing now a move towards better definition and measures of accessibility. It hasn't reached the bumper sticker yet, but it's actually an area where we know a lot more because the database is so rich. We actually can know things just in time that we would have never known 10 years ago maybe even five years ago, and we know it worldwide. Applying an accessibility lens, taking this lens and putting it on urban transport and land policies, including the evaluation and even the funding policies that we have, should take this into consideration. And that's something we're starting to do, as you can see with some of the small examples I've given. What we haven't figured out yet is facilitating interdisciplinary approaches and coordination. In order to make this work, you have to have these three specialties talking the same language, and frankly, they don't. The fiscal financial affairs don't know about accessibility. The urban planning is run usually outside of transport, uh, in silos, not often coordinated. Uh, and one of the problems comes to governance, and not vertical governance, national government, local government, horizontal governance. This is a really tough one. You have a different problem here. Las Vegas has, has county commission which looks more metropolitan than any other. But the US is a very localized political context. 
We have 20,000 municipalities in the US, and that hasn't changed. We don't aggregate. I come from Woodbridge Township in New Jersey, and we, when I was young, they had a, a referendum whether they could become a city because they were 150,000 people. They were no longer under the definition of a $10,000, $15,000 people uh, township. And they voted, and they would have gotten a lot of benefits by being a city from HUD and others at that time. This is in the 60s. So now you know my age. But they voted it down because of the local culture, because they want, didn't want to seem like a city. Yeah, they're a city, but I don't want to, I want to still be a township. And that's very different than when you look in Europe. Europe has a lot of municipalities, but their, their management system, especially if you look at France, came from the top down. Even Germany has the metropolitan Lund. Um, Italy is even moving in that direction. They're talking about metropolitan governance. We haven't gotten there. What we use, we have transport authorities. We're working cross units on transport because it's technocratically accepted. But how much do we give these authorities, these technical authorities, any kind of power over land use? And how much taxation power? Any mayor in his right mind would not give up land development rights and tax rights. It's really hard. But we're more decentralized fiscally as well as functionally than almost any other country, including in the developing world. But that's where we need to look. This is, these are part of the big challenges, how we work cross-sectorally and how we work in this. Not looking for big revolutionary change, but how we go piece by piece with a better analysis. Um, nobody, we got only a few questions. I have time for a few more. Uh, I don't know if I can ask another one. I don't want to be in a common class either, but would reducing urbanization or trying to encourage it, would that reduce our environmental um, I don't see how. I, you know, urbanization is, I mean, it, it happened naturally. It happens naturally. It's happening naturally everywhere in the world. Um, it just makes a lot of sense. And more and more people, there's actually, there is a, a differing view of people of, of wanting to be in the downtown. There's actually, a, you go out to suburbs now and you find land prices going down uh, in some areas. So I, no, I, I don't see that. I think there's a practical, realistic, even on environmental, there, there could be, it could be better, depending on how you manage your footprint. So uh, you said that uh, if we invest in these low, you know, accessible communities, we gentrify them. Um, you know, I kind of believe a rising, t you know, rising tide raises all ships, and I, I see that argument where you say, well, maybe they're better off. Uh, could, you, could you kind of go into that? Like, yeah. Let I, me, I think that's, that, that'd be good. Let me, let me come back to that. Because okay. the, the issue of gentrification, I want to be, I want to amend what I said a little bit. It doesn't happen everywhere. You put in a transit station, it's not necessarily going to do what it's done in DC or, or, but you can see in Berlin they're having problems. It's more specific. What we don't understand yet is what are the elements, what are the variables that actually bring it together to cause uh, gentrification, displacement. Uh, and I think we need to better understand. But the most amazing thing is I've had, since I've tried to research this and go through, is how little is really written on what's happening and how little empirical information. So if you want to do a PhD thesis, be my guest, tell me about it, and I'll bless it. I won't finance it, but I'll bless it. <laughs> Quite a question, yes. So regarding that gentrification and stuff. Go ahead. You, yeah, I'm just going one, two. So when we thought of this filtering process in the housing market, you know, the actual beneficiary of those gentrification efforts is a preferable residential value. That's not necessarily marginally attached to the population. It's not necessarily it's not necessarily the marginally attached, you know, the residents they will be mainly forced out of that region. So that there is a huge criticism about those type of you know, urban gentrification, because who actually gets a benefit? And actually, as you pointed out at the end of your presentation, those city governments, they will collect more tax, expand the tax revenue. And those who can afford those gentrified, more better communities can plug in. Well, but this is why having an accessibility lens allows you to focus on that and understand what kind of policy would mitigate 
or what Monte Carlo policy might accelerate. And I think we have to look at value capture and taxation. There is a lot of things, pre-buying of land, putting it in a trust, because that is really the biggest problem. When the city wants to do something, it's usually too late. You get a development in Washington, you have city center, you need 20% of the units by law have to be for low and moderate income people. It's a ridiculous place to do it, so they gave the money to the city. The city went to another part of the city where they owned some land, and they built, and it was near in, and that was very good. Then they tried another place where they didn't own land, and the speculators got there, and they were washed out. They couldn't do the low-income housing. So there is a dynamic that we have to understand, and, and there are initiatives. I mean, it, what I see happening is these initiatives, and this is what you see here, everywhere spots and pieces of it happening. And it hasn't come together yet. Well, it's, uh, yeah. no, it is a question, and it's a question what you do, and also will it hold over time? If it goes too gentrified in terms of high end, are people even going to have the services and commerce that th they would need for a different model of, of population? What a lot of suburban areas and other areas are doing because they can't get the firemen and the police and the teachers to live in town, they'll do a lot more moderate income, lower middle income kind of housing. Um, does that work? I don't know. I'm, there are a lot of initiatives out there over the last 15 years. What there is no is I haven't seen a lot of ex post analysis of how long that really held up and who got it. Was it just students coming out of college, you know, who classified as lower middle income or whatever, got some cheap housing for a while, and got married, then moved up the chain? Or was it truly the population you wanted? There was a question back here. Hey. Yeah, and your, uh, your, um, Research really re reveals some interesting ways of looking at transportation. And are, are you, by any chance, planning to do something here in Las Vegas? Because uh, the, the problem here is really very simple. Uh, we have a, a huge concentration of jobs in the resort con uh, corridor, two or 300,000 jobs. And yet the, the, the inside of the city is being ruined uh, even though they pay for all these thousands of, uh, of developments in the outside, in the periphery of the city, uh, there's, th they're poor areas now. And the rich areas are in the outside, but they're rich because they, the, uh, the developers contribute a lot to the county commission in terms of <laughs> donations. And, uh, and th this is cheap land and they can make a huge profit. And so the wealth is moving to the outside, and yet the, the people can't get to work. I, it's, actually, I'm meeting with the RTC tomorrow, so <laughs> I'll take a look. I, you know, I, I can't opine. I, I don't know enough about Las Vegas to opine at that level. Uh, and to see what I have seen is your, at least your governance structure, and definitely your economic structure, is different than a lot of places. It's very, it's, I, I find it unique. I haven't found another city like it. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't put these kinds of analyses together and try to see what, it, what that means, where the accessibility problem is, where the housing problem is. But uh, I'm saying I'm giving you kind of a framework, but not, not an answer as to what it means for this specific city. We got, sorry, we got a, we're in a hurry. So one more question, sir. At the beginning, when you uh, briefly mentioned sustainability and you said that we have this missing social component, uh, I will say there is also uh, sustainability in terms of having the resources required to operate, maintain, and expand the system in perpetuity, right? And it's linked to accessibility in the sense that when you increase accessibility, typically you also increase the demand for transportation because now it's easier, cheaper uh, to travel, and that in turn increases the demand or the resources required to uh, uh, take care of the, of the demand. Yeah, I, I think we always miss that, um, the operation and maintenance. I mean, I've been fighting that all my life in developing countries, but I've fought it here. And actually, it's a problem. It goes to this horizontal governance problem. If you have a technical authority responsible for the roads or for transport, if they don't also have a financial source, which we have a problem in Washington with MAMADA, 
then what you see is exactly that. The maintenance drops, and then the traffic drops, and then you go into a, a hyper mode about try, we're closing down the system on uh, whole parts of system for days, and people can't use the metro in parts of DC because they have to maintain and make up for years of focusing on extending the system and cutting the ribbons rather than maintaining the system. And part of that is now coming to, to, uh, to that is a major issue when we're talking about funding and finance. I didn't go into the fiscal and pricing and finance. That is a whole other area that I agree with you. Thank you. I always have to apologize for cutting our conversation short, but I do have to get Jeff to a class. Uh, some of you in this room may be in that class. Uh, so thanks again for coming out tonight. We'll be back in a week if you can join us. Uh, Ted Picone, our colleague from Brookings, will be out, who's an expert on Cuba. So it's a very timely and interesting time to be talking about in the United States and its changing policies with Cuba. So I hope you can join us. Thanks again. Thanks.